All right, here we are, Daniel Revelation for Beginners. We're in lesson number eight of this uh, series. All right, well, so far we've been able to put Revelation into context, despite its symbolism and its style, which is the major obstacle to understand it. If you understand the style and you know, the symbols, you're able to work your way through that to get to the core message of this particular book. Uh, basically, as we've said so far, very quickly to review, written by John the Apostle to the early churches with the goal of encouraging them to persevere under Roman persecution. Um, and also, another purpose of the book is to provide an ongoing encouragement to every generation concerning the ever-present power of evil uh, in the world and Christ's ultimate victory in the end. So it not only encouraged the church in the first century in a very real sense, it continues to encourage the church in every generation because there's evil in every generation. There's always, I mean, we're, we're kind of far removed from it now, but uh, not many, many years ago, World War II, uh, you know, we were, at, were aghast at uh, the, some of the modern wars that we're in where perhaps uh, six or 7,000 lives are lost, which are tragic, of course. But when you look at World War II, we're talking in the millions, millions of lives were lost in that war. So people at that time surely thought that the world was coming to an end. And so uh, various, there's a need for this type of encouragement all the way through history, even into modern times. And so we began with John's vision of Jesus and his warning to the church to prepare for struggle uh, and to pers persevere in suffering if they wanted the prize of eternal life. And so in the first view, which we studied previously, John sees Jesus addressing the church in its predicament here on earth. Those letters to the seven churches, that's very much, that was very much uh, apropos for the time. Those seven letters were to real churches who existed at the time that John was writing this uh, book. Now the next vision, which is going to be the longest one, is the vision that John has of Christ as he takes his position in heaven. So the first vision is Christ talking to the church on earth. Second vision is Christ taking his position in heaven. So far we've only seen him in human form, I mean Jesus that is, in the Gospels. We've seen him in humiliation and in death with a brief moment of glory at the resurrection. Now, John will describe the glorious Jesus in the heavenly realm where He reigns. And so we begin vision two, that would be in chapter four. We're going to read a little bit. We're not going to read everything, but we're going to read some passages here just to get some context. So chapter four, beginning in uh, verse one, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. So with chapter four begins a vision of heaven and a revelation of what will shortly take place on earth. Now I said that a device of apocalyptic literature was that the action was played out in the celestial realm. Okay? True to form, John's vision is one that sees the characters and the symbols in a heavenly scene, but the action, is taking place th the action that is taking place there will describe the things that are soon to take place on earth. Okay, so he sees a vision, the action that's happening, there, that's happening there is pointing to something that's going to be happening on earth. So chapter four establishes the scene of the vision uh, in heaven, the spiritual world, um, which is God's throne. And it does so to confirm that what will happen and what will be said is of divine origin, not human origin. So the idea of God's throne is the central idea or image of the book and it suggests power and sovereignty. Uh, the jewels that are mentioned refer to uh, beauty and value. 
Uh, the 24 elders mentioned represent majesty and authority. You know, elders, of course, may be uh, angels who are, spiritual, uh, who are spiritual counterparts to the 12 patriarchs uh, and the 12 apostles. In other words, they're the leaders in a heavenly uh, chorus of praise. Uh, the golden crowns uh, are an, em an emblem of dignity uh, and honor. Some other um, symbols. Uh, thunder and lightning are signs of sudden display of God's power and authority in spiritual or supernatural ways. So when he talks about thunder and lightning, he's, he's, you know, the, it's the symbol for the power that God can show all of a sudden. Uh, you know, like the, 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 the 10 plagues you know, that, that, that uh, overtook uh, Egypt, that God sent on Egypt. They were powerful things that, that appeared all of a sudden. Okay? Uh, the crystal sea is actually the heavenly counterpart for the Red Sea, and it represents anticipated actions of God's salvation. Think now for a second. Salvation for the Jews at first was at the Red Sea with Moses. You know, they had their, you know, you know, on one side they had the army, the Egyptian army, the other side they had the sea, the sea opened up and they went through it. So their salvation was through the Red Sea at the beginning. Now remember, what's on earth in the story of the Jews and Christ and the church is a shadow. It's an image of what actually exists in heaven. We are seeing in a symbolic way the real things which are reflected on earth. Okay? What happens here? You know the church, right? The church is the bride of Christ. It's the physical manifestation of His body which will be glorified and which we will understand and see perfectly at the second coming. But the church here on earth made up of sinners, forgiven sinners, is not the quote, the final product. It's not the final thing. Okay? It's a shadow of the thing to come. All right? Uh, the four living creatures with many eyes and wings that he talks about are not meant to be grotesque. It's not meant to be a horror movie you know, with beasts and creatures, you know, even though they, it's kind of strange when you look at it, but there's significance uh, in the way these creatures are described. Uh, for example, the ox represents service and the lion represents strength. Uh, the man the face of a man represents intelligence and the face or the image of an eagle represents swiftness. So these characters are the attendants of the heavenly <coughs> worship. Remember, it's not meant to be horror. It's meant to demonstrate uh, to the human mind uh, various, um, uh, various uh, strengths, uh, various principles, various attributes, uh, but you know, John is using things that a human being would, under, would understand, would relate a lion to strength. You know, that would be an easy connection. Okay? So the scene is set, and with chapter five, the action begins that will tell a story, a story that will be, in essence, the prophecy of the things that will happen to the church in its struggle with Rome and its ongoing struggle with the principle of evil embodied by Rome in the future until Jesus returns. And so this evil will be embodied by other things until the time when its final manifestation, which is the Antichrist, the final manifestation of evil, the Antichrist, will be revealed and destroyed for all time. So what he's describing is true historically for the Roman Empire, but the essence of evil that manifested itself as the Roman Empire will continue to manifest itself throughout the ages. And at the very end of the age, before Jesus comes, it'll embody itself in this thing called this thing, this person, this movement, this ideology called the Antichrist. All right? And that will be revealed and destroyed by Christ when He comes. All right, so chapter five, let's uh, go to chapter five, read a long passage here this time. Again, I said I, I wasn't able to, you know, in a half hour we can't read all the passages. I'm always encouraging you to read ahead so you'll be familiar with the things that I'm talking about. But let's uh, read a couple of verses here, chapter five, um, 
beginning in verse one, he says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the uh, tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Uh, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. All right, so the storyline is that there is a sealed book that no one was found who was worthy or able to open and read. Then a lamb appears to whom all characters give homage and he is found to be worthy of opening the book. And of course the lamb, I mean, is easy to figure out, the lamb who was slain you know, is Christ. Okay, so let's look at some of the symbols here in this passage. The scroll, of course, is a message. The fact that it's written on the front and on the back suggests a full message, a complete message. Uh, the seven seals, uh, the idea that it gives is that it is very secure. It's a future message. It's secure. Nobody can open it. Nobody can discern it. Nobody can figure it out. Right? Um, the lion and the lamb, both sides of suffering servant and victorious Messiah fused into one image. Jesus came as the lamb, the suffering servant, but he arose from the dead victorious, the lion. Okay, so we fused those two into one single image. The seven horn, the seven eyes, Horns are for strength, they represent strength. Eyes represent spiritual nature. The seven spirits uh, is the Holy Spirit. So referring to one who is part of the Godhead. The harp is the symbol for praise. The bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints. Uh, one of the Psalms talks about that, Psalm 141 uh, verse two. So the Lord Jesus in heaven, being worshiped there in authority and praise, will Himself reveal the things about the matters that will take place. That's what this image is saying. So let's go to chapter three now. Chapter, excuse me, chapter six now. Beginning in verse one, he says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, As with a voice of thunder, come. I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come, and another, a red horse went out and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men should slay one another and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come, I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, 
and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come, I looked and behold an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with the pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? So now the action begins as the Lamb begins to break the seals one by one which reveal each in turn various characters and events to take place. Now we see with the beginning of this chapter a combination of things presented like a parade in review. If you can imagine, have you ever been to a parade or like a military parade or any kind of parade, you're standing there and there's you know, floats going by. If it's a military parade, there are bands, there are groups of men and women marching and sometimes they're dragging equipment by and guns and cannons and so on and so forth. You know? Well, this here is a parade. Okay, that's what he's describing, a parade. Um, uh, so this is, this is a parade like where God begins to display His power at His disposal in order to bring judgment on the enemy. That's the whole idea here. I remember seeing video or old um, you know, uh, newsreels of uh, military parades in, in, in Russia back in the old days you know, uh, or in China and you had these massive armies, you know, goose stepping across Red Square and they would be dragging their nuclear weapons and their tanks and everything. And what were they doing? Well, they were you know, a show of strength. Don't mess with us. Look at this. You're going to have to face this. Well, this image is something like that, except it's God that's parading by everyone the power that's at His disposal. So each horse is paraded to show a facet of God's power not yet unleashed. It's previewed. It's a show of strength. So in verse 9 to 11, there's the image of the martyrs who had been persecuted. And this is done to remind the reader as to the reason why God is preparing this show of force to bring about judgment. There's a reason He's showing this show, this show of force, and that's because His saints were martyred. His saints were killed and murdered, and so on and so forth. So this is the judgment that's going to come because of that. So here's a demonstration of my power and judgment, and this is the reason why it will be used. Now the reference to natural disasters is also a reference to his power to use nature for his own purposes, and that man is helpless to fight against this. You know, remember I said that the style of apocalyptic literature was always very dramatic. The rescue of the good and the punishment of the evil is always very emotional, very dramatic. You know, the blood, the stars falling down, the earth shaking, you know, very dramatic. This is not to say that God's judgment isn't sure, but Rome did not fall in one crushing or climactic moment as described here in the book of Revelation. It didn't all happen in a day, right? It fell gradually over a period of decades with a, you know, a big bang at the end there. So apocalyptic literature 
collapses the time and makes things happen in a much more rapid and spectacular fashion. And if we want a, 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 a similarity to today, watch a movie. You watch a movie and what's taking place in the movie may, may take place over a number of years, but what do they do? They collapse the action down so in an hour and a half or two hours you get the whole story. Well, that's what's happening here. You get the whole story of several centuries of, of events that are going to eventually take place collapsed down to just one uh, heavenly dynamic uh, image. So let's take a look at the symbols, shall we? The white horse, the bow, the crown refers to victory and authority. The red horse, persecution. The great sword, killing, butchering, you know, violence. Uh, the black horse is the forerunner of death. The scale with wheat and oil, so on and so forth. Economic chaos, economic choices, economic necessities. The pale horse is uh, death and punishment in hell. The souls, of course, that, that, that uh, are talked about here are life, those who have life, spiritual life. The white robe, purity, those who are innocent. And the heavenly signs of natural phenomenon. That's the judgment of nations. You know, uh, Joel talks about that when he talks about the, uh, the, the, the moon filled with blood and the stars falling. Whenever you see you know, celestial bodies moving around or falling or exploding in the Bible, usually it's referring to the judgment of a nation or another. Not always referring to the end of the world. Sometimes it just refers to one particular judgment on one particular nation, like the nation of, of uh, the Jews, the nation of Israel at one point. 70 AD, they were wiped out by the, uh, by the Roman uh, Empire. So you know, the, the Bible talks about uh, when that was uh, going to happen in terms of natural uh, disaster. So now we move to chapter seven. Uh, we're not going to read uh, anything in there for now. Um, let's, let's remember that in the previous chapter, the lamb has been opening the seals, six seals so far, and all of them show the awesome power that God has and will unleash on His enemy and the enemy of His people. Now in chapter seven, there is a break in the action as he reassures the faithful that his judgment will not indiscriminately fall on them as well. And so you know, to destroy Rome with all of the firepower described would make a person think that they'd also be taken out by you know, friendly fire. <laughs> you know, God's taking Rome out. We live in Rome. We live in the Roman Empire. God's going to destroy all of that. Maybe we're going to get blown up with all of these other guys. And so John, in his vision, there's a pause in the vision to reassure the faithful, don't worry, you, know, you guys are safe. God assures the church that He is able to judge and destroy Rome without destroying the Christians who live in the empire. And He's able to do this for two reasons. First of all, he talks about this in verse three, the saints are sealed. When he talks about a seal on the saints, it means they're protected. They're identified by God Himself. If you're sealed by God, all right, it means you're safe. That's why he says, and what's the seal? It doesn't say it here, but we know the seal is the Holy Spirit. Right? God gives us the Holy Spirit at baptism, so we have the seal. And then in verse 14 he talks about the fact that saints are part of God's kingdom and Jesus has already promised that the kingdom is indestructible. The gates of Hades will not prevail. Hell itself, demons, it's, demons themselves will not be able to destroy the church. So if demons can't destroy the church, well, certainly a world power will not be able to destroy the church. And so here you know, they're described in their already glorified state, meaning the saints, when he's talking about the saints there. They're already uh, uh, in their glorified states, uh, state in heaven. But the ones described as having white robes and singing around God's throne, these are the saints. These are, these, this is the church, okay? the Christians. You have to remember that, in, 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 especially in apocalyptic literature, they sometimes say the same thing several times in different ways. All right, so if you keep that in mind. So let's look at the symbols. 
Uh, first of all, a seal. It shows ownership, protection against tampering, also denotes genuineness. So those who are sealed by God means these are the original ones, the true believers. The 144,000, well, that's a little more complicated. Remember we talked about Jewish numerology. I even gave you a handout for Jewish numerology. For the Jews, numbers had specific symbolism. So the 144,000 refers to the church. That's, that's who the 144,000 are. It's the church. Okay? And the, way, the, the, the significance of the number 144,000, let's break it down. The number 12 is the symbol of God working in the world or working within His organized religious body, which is the church. Why is 12 that? Because three represents God, four represents His creation, north, south, east, west, four. So three and four, any combination, four plus three, seven, a perfect number. Four times three, God working in His creation to create the thing that His creation was made to create, and that is the church. Okay? So then you have 12, you know, that thing that God was going to create, times 12. That's the total of all probability. Every single saint, every single saint, every single Christian, every, every single one that's supposed to be saved, because God knows in advance who's going to be saved. Remember, He doesn't choose, but He knows, because He has foreknowledge, He knows which one will choose Him and which ones will reject Him. And so the 144, all the ones that he knows are going to choose him. And then 1,000, the number 10 means something which is mature, fully ripened. So 10 times 10 times 10 equals 1,000, meaning the most mature and complete that something can become you know, to the nth degree. So if you take 144 multiplied by 1,000, what you get symbolically is the most complete number without failing and without exception, the 144,000. Now I know that the, there are a lot of other you know, interpretations of 144,000 as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, 139,824, 139,835, you know, like a number of people, but no. That's not how Jews use numbers. They didn't use numbers like that. Somebody in the modern era decided to use that number you know, for his own or her own you know, purpose. But the Jews didn't use numbers like that. And remember, good Bible study, first you figure out how did the people in those days use that number and what did it mean to them? Well, what it meant to them was the perfect group. The perfect group. Just like the thousand year reign, the perfect time period that God knows. 144,000, the perfect group that God knows. He knows who they are, every single one, not a one will be lost, okay? Uh, palm branches, symbol of victory. So God reassures the saints that despite the great tribulation and judgment to come, He will watch over them because they are sealed and, and they are counted by Him personally. And He will not lose a single one. That's the significance and that's the point of encouragement for that number as the Jews in the first, or Jewish Christians in the first century would read it. Now, this does not mean that they will not be persecuted or affected by the things that will happen to, you know, to them by Rome, but rather that no matter what happens, they are safe with God and they will be part of that heavenly group. Okay, moving on. Chapters 8 to 11. Now we're not going to read, we're just going to go the storyline through these. These three chapters will describe the opening of the seventh seal. Remember, the first six seals demonstrates God's power to judge and to destroy, you know, the parade of strength there. The seventh seal, when the Lamb opens the seventh seal, 
there is silence in heaven. Then this open seal reveals seven trumpets. So the seventh seal opens and it reveals seven trumpets. Like the horses, the trumpets announce more power at God's disposal to destroy His enemy. You know the horses they were paraded by? Well the trumpets, they sound. You hear the noise okay, to announce what they have to announce. So the first four trumpets describe natural calamities that God will use as instruments of His punishment. Hail, fire, storms, and so on and so forth. Trumpets five and six describe the internal and external decadence that God will permit, which will lead to the weakening and the eventual destruction of the Roman Empire. Okay? Then in the middle of this description, there is another interlude where God's judgment is pronounced and then three other elements are introduced. You understand what I'm saying? It's like a big long parade. You got the horses going by, then you got the trump, then you get the seventh seal open up, you got trumpets announcing stuff, and then there's another interlude, and then there's other action that takes place. All right, so here's the other action that takes place. In chapter 10, verses eight to 11, uh, it says the following. Uh, then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So the little book uh, is the prophecy that John has to make concerning revelation. It'll be good to see the future. Wow, we win in the end. It'll be good to see the future, but it'll be bitter to have to tell the church of the coming suffering. So in essence, the little book here, it's Good news, bad news. I got good news for you. I'm going to let you see the future. I'm going to let you see us win in the end. That's the good news. The bad news is, in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of suffering. Okay? That's, that's the significance of that. Then in chapter 11, let's go to chapter 11, there's the measurement of the temple. It says, uh, let's see, chapter 11, one and two. It says, then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So the measurement of the temple, this is another way of saying that the church will be protected. Remember the 144,000, the perfect number that God knows? Okay, now he's saying the same thing over again, except this time he's using the imagery of measuring. The temple, that's the church. I'm measuring the temple, you know, and God knows the measurements. Don't worry about it, He knows. Now, before, as I say, He referred to the 144,000 who were sealed. Now the same promise is made, but in terms of a temple that is strictly measured and strictly protected, okay? Next, let's go to uh, chapter 11 again, verse three and four, where he talks about the two witnesses. He says, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the, uh, before the, Lord of the earth. So the two witnesses symbolize the gospel. The two witnesses preach successfully, they are killed and then they resurrect and go to heaven. Well, the two witnesses for the Jews would be Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the two witnesses would be Peter preaching to the Jews and Paul preaching to the Gentiles. And all of this takes place in 1260 days, which is three and a half years. Now, now, three and a half years refers to a short period of time. Uh, that's a, a, a short period of time. Remember seven? We got half, three and a half is half of seven, half of one week. So the episode of the two witnesses 
is a symbol for the story of the church from its foundation until the destruction of Rome. Okay? It begins preaching, the church rather, begins preaching powerfully, it's persecuted, it's martyred, and finally it resurrects to victory as Rome falls, all in about three centuries, short period of time. For the gospel, three centuries is not a long period of time. Okay? That's why three and a half weeks, 12, 60 days, not, not quite a week, not quite a full period, a short period of time. It's not the end of the world. You see, it's not at the end of the world. It's a short time, three and a half years. Okay? A time in the future, a time that will happen, a time that is sure, but it's not the end of the world. So after this interlude, describing the little book, the temple and the two witnesses, the seventh trumpet is sounded and it reveals great rejoicing at the victory of the saints. God judges the people and the ark is placed in heaven. And then a final scene of victory and rejoicing. So let's take a look at the symbols that would be found there. Talks about the key, the key means authority. The locusts, we didn't read that, but if you do, you read about the locusts. The locusts are the effect of immorality on society. Uh, Abaddon and Apollyon are other names for Satan. The Euphrates, March, it talks about the Euphrates, which is the furthest border from Rome. Um, the, uh, the hordes of troops are barbarians that will be invading Rome. Uh, the rainbow is mentioned, I need to move over here, there we go. The rainbow that is mentioned and described refers to mercy. The measuring rod is the way to know the truth. Okay, so I've tried to read some of the passages and hopefully you've read some of the passages and I'm giving you the meaning of some of the symbols and trying to tie all this together. It's a lot of material you know, for a, a, a short lesson. But let me, let me just summarize you know, this second vision here. In dramatic fashion, we see Christ reveal the future destruction of Rome and the persecution of the saints through this period of time. Now, the book does this by first revealing the many aspects of God's power in controlling natural and supernatural forces that He will use in destroying Rome, you know, the parade and all of that. Then um, it also reveals the continued suffering of the saints but it provides a promise that despite this, God has numbered them, God has measured them, God has sealed them, so that despite the persecution, in the end they will be saved. Okay? And then through several devices, it gives a scenario of how it will happen. The church will begin strong. It'll be almost or seemingly destroyed by Rome, and then it will overcome and the Roman enemy will ultimately fall and be destroyed. And basically all these symbols and all these images are really this very simple story here. God has power, He's going to use power to destroy the church's enemies. The church will be persecuted and will suffer terrible loss, but don't be afraid, God has measured you, God has sealed you, God has counted you, he knows exactly who you are, so don't be afraid. And then finally, and this is how it will happen. This is, watch the, watch the, you know, the flow of events. Start strong, go down, persecution, victory when Rome is defeated. And in the same way, it'll be with us. There'll be periods of persecution and difficulty. Jesus even said it, in season, out of season. Sometimes you preach, you preach, you preach, you teach, you teach, you teach, nothing, nothing happens. No harvest. Well, you know, he told us. Sometimes it'll be in season, sometimes it'll be out of season. What, what, would, what do we need to continue doing? We need to keep on preaching, because he said, in season, out of season. Our job is to preach. Our job is to persevere, no matter what the season is. Okay, so next time, we're going to see how this struggle is described once again, but this time using a whole other set of symbols. And if we understand that he keeps telling the same story using different symbols, 
Remember we studied Daniel? The, the, the image of the, of, the, uh, of the statue, and he told that same story over and over again using different symbols. Well, this is the same thing that happens in the book of Revelation. The story I've just described to you is going to be told again using different symbols. So please keep reading forward, all right, so you'll be familiar with the material. All right, that's it for this time. Thank you very much for your attention.